Take your Bible this morning and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Two verses I want us to read in unison together this morning, verses 9 and 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as our custom is, let's all stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And we'll read verses 9 and 10 in unison, beginning with verse number 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Ready? For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we ask you to add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful music today, and Lord, the good fellowship together and the good spirit in this place. And Lord, we're asking now that you would continue to prepare our hearts that we'll be ready to receive your word this morning, that, Lord, you'll bless the special as it's sung, and it'll cause our focus and our attention to be drawn to you. Lord, don't let our minds wander and think about other things that would keep us from receiving the message you have for us today. Bless the special to that end. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. That's wonderful. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now as we open up your word this morning and receive the truth that you have for us today. I pray that you would help each of us to give our attention to the only book that you've ever written, that you would help us to focus and not allow other things and distractions to hinder us from receiving the message you have for us this morning. Thank you for the guests who are here today, and thank you for everyone, Lord, that's made the effort to be in church this morning. Lord, by those, I pray you'd minister to us, and you'd also minister to those who are watching by way of the internet. Lord, I pray that we would somehow, again, be able to grasp in some capacity how wonderful your grace is to us. I guess for lack of any other adjective, we just say, it's amazing grace. We love you this morning. I pray you'll bless the message to our hearts today, as only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. What is grace? Amazing grace. We know we define it sometimes as God's unmerited favor, undeserved favor. We sometimes call it God's divine influence on our heart. God's divine encouragement or His sufficiency for our insufficiency. Grace, somebody said, is the president of Kroger's giving you a free trip to Hawaii even though he knows you shop at Costco. That's grace. Grace is God allowing us into heaven despite having sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's pretty amazing. You see, grace is exhibited in the desire and the willingness and the ability to grant favor as a gift where it's not, not, not deserved. It's graciousness, not just in, in words, but in actions. The divine influence is exercised in the heart of God and He gives that grace to us that we could exercise it to others. I want you to understand that the New Testament is not the, the part of the Bible that's full of grace and the Old Testament is, oh, that's all, we don't have to listen to that, that's all part of the law. I, I just read this morning, there's a, there's a famous pastor in America who has come out saying that, you know, we've got to quit putting up Ten Commandments, they're not for us. I've got news for you, the, the Bible's for us and the Ten Commandments are for us. Uh, we don't get them to go to heaven, but they sure are a good code of conduct to live by, amen? Grace was before the law was ever given. In Genesis 6 and verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God was gracious before the law, but God was gracious during the time they had the law. Let me read you Jeremiah 31.2. It said, Thus saith the Lord, the people which were of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. Israel found grace even in the wilderness. So God's always been gracious. How do I know that? Because He said, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. So God's, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if He's gracious now, He always was gracious. Don't, don't think, oh man, I'm glad I wasn't in the Old Testament and God just wiped people out. You know, I'm glad I'm under grace and not under law. Well, God was gracious then too. Just as God is gracious to you and me now, He's gracious to us. Now the grace of God has many facets to it. I, I don't know if I mentioned last week, I mentioned to several, I think in private conversation, this is... This is something I really, uh, I, I'm really wrestling with grace, Brother Yoder. You know, I, I'm, I like a, I like something I kind of get a hold of and and I can put it into a one, two, three, you know, uh, uh, format. And and grace is so huge and and so all encompassing and so all filling and so many sides of it and so big. I, I'm having trouble getting my arms around it. I don't know that I ever will. But I, so I just try to, I, I kind of feel like I just take off a chunk and say, well, I'll give them this chunk tomorrow and we'll see what happens. 
Uh, it, it's, it's just amazing to me the grace of God. But, we, we, but can I say this? Everything we have is by God's grace. Everything we have is by God's grace. Our salvation is by grace. But the Bible says we, we get the Spirit of God by His grace. It says, uh, Paul said in Acts, I commend you to the Word of His grace. Why do you have a Bible today? Because God's gracious to us to give us His Word. So we have His Spirit by His grace and His Word by His grace. We, when we pray, we come boldly to the throne of grace. that We can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Everything is by God's grace. It was, it was wonderful to see this past Monday night when Clemson beat Alabama for the national title of NCAA football to their coach, Dabo Sweeney, is, a, is an outspoken Christian. And for him to say, you know, it's just the grace of God that we can experience this. That he gave the, the glory to God uh, for the opportunity to be in a game like that. Didn't put it on himself, didn't say, well, you know, I'm one of the greatest coaches of all time, or, or you know, these guys did this or that. He just said, gave the glory to God. And, and he recognized the grace of God. The grace of God. So I, I'm glad for the grace of God. There's three, three facets or three aspects I want to talk to you about grace this morning. The first is saving grace. Saving grace. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we know we're saved by grace. We understand we're sinners in the sight of a holy God. God is holy, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. There's no sin at all. And so we understand we're all sinners. When I give this in the prison, I always say, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, And I say, now what does all mean? All means all. That's all all means. Now it's easy when I'm in the, in sitting and the guys are all in blue and they got numbers on their chest to say, okay, do I have to spend a long time here saying that we know we've done things wrong? Do we have to know that, uh, how, many, how many of you guys say, well admit I've done things that God says I shouldn't do? Well, of course, I'm in prison. Of course you know I've done something wrong. It's not so easy when I'm looking at these folks with no number on your shirt. To say that you and I are guilty in the sight of God. We do not deserve to go to heaven. We deserve to be punished for our sin in hell. That's what we deserve. We deserving of the judgment of God. God is just. In fact, we've looked at this before. I want you to turn over to John chapter 3. Would you do that with me please? John chapter 3. John 3, most of you are very familiar with, and and you're particularly familiar probably with John 3 and verse 16. Though I don't want to take that for granted, it was, I'm trying to think what year it was when Tim Tebow played at the University of Florida. I think it was his junior year, and he was one of the first guys to ever wear this black underneath his eyes with a Bible verse written on it. He had a Bible reference there. He was the first one ever to put black under his eye with the reference John 3.16 on it. He just had John 3.16 underneath each eye. They didn't think about it. They played the game. It was the following Tuesday, and he wrote about this in his book. The following Tuesday, he was having lunch with Urban Meyer, who was the coach at Florida then. And he took a phone call, Urban Meyer did, and yes, okay, wow. And... He hung up and Tebow asked who that was. He said, that was our sports information director. He said, you wore John 3.16 under your eyelids, under your eyes during that game. He said, the people from Google called him. And up to that point, it was the largest searched item Google had ever had. During that two-hour game, 93 million people Googled, what is John 3.16? That's that's astounding to me that that many people did not know what John 3.16 was. But uh, I don't take it for granted that you know John 3.16. But the Bible says, For God so loved the world 
that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, a lot of people know that, but they sure don't have any idea what 17 and 18 say. Keep reading with me, will you please? For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. So, did God send Jesus to condemn the world? No. He sent Him to save the world. Now, my question is, why won't Christ condemn the world? Well, look at verse 18. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. You believe on Jesus, you're not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Someone is born and they live and they do not believe in Jesus Christ. They do not trust Him as their Savior. He doesn't have to condemn them. They're condemned already. We're, we're, we're born under that condemnation. The only way to get out from underneath that condemnation is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. He's the only way out. He's the only, the only way you can have salvation. When we say you're saved by grace, why would God send His only begotten Son to die for me. Grace. There's no other way to explain that. Just simply His grace. When we say we're saved by grace alone, we mean it's that our salvation from the wrath of God and the condemnation of God, our deliverance from hell, is because of something good in God, not something good in us. You get that? Our salvation is not because there's something good in us. It's because it's something good in God that He would want to save us. See, grace means, there. number one, there's something good in God, and number two, there's nothing good in you and me. Now, I know we don't have a problem with the first point. God is a good God and He does good things. We would say, that's, that's right on, preacher. But when we get to us and we say, I know that there's nothing good in us, whoa, 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 wait a minute, preacher. So we don't like that because our pride gets in the way of that. Say, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm, I'm this or I'm that. And so we have to be very careful that, that we, 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 don't, we, we feel like it's too harsh or too judgmental on ourselves. Do all. Listen, do good people go to heaven? Be careful. This, 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 this boggles me every time I see these statistics. In a recent survey, 84% of evangelical Christians agreed with this statement that when it, quote, when it comes to salvation, God helps those who help themselves. Now, by the way, God helps those who help themselves is not in the Bible. It's not Scripture. And certainly, it is so far removed from salvation. Hear me this morning. I don't want to be misunderstood at all. And if you ever come in and you sit in, a, in, the, in the Bible preaching at Bible Baptist Church, you want to know something, that it's nothing that you do, none of us are good enough to get to heaven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us are righteous. No, not one. God, God doesn't save those who help themselves. God saves those who are helpless themselves. And God saves us by His grace. In that same survey, 49% agreed. That's almost half of them. Half of the people in gospel preaching churches agree that there are other ways to come to God besides Jesus Christ alone. That, I about need duct tape to hold my brains in. That, that just floors me. Are we that influenced by the world? That influenced by the media? By the political correctness of our age? We just spoke in Sunday school this morning. Jesus said, I am the... No, we didn't. Boy, I'm going to go home now. What the... I am the door! The door! Boy, we spent all that time on the door, and I said, I am the, the way. I don't know. Sometimes you just feel like a complete failure, brother. You're a complete failure. He's the door, not a door. 
Not one of the many doors. He's the door. He's the only way that you'll get to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. I don't care if you're a member of the Baptist church. That doesn't get you to heaven. Okay? You have to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Without Jesus Christ, there's none that doeth good. No, not one. None of us are good. Certainly not good enough to go to heaven. And it's amazing, 34% of the evangelicals in this survey said yes to the proposition that, quote, all good people go to heaven. The Bible says there's none that doeth good. No, not one. We've all sinned and come short. We all come up short. Nobody will make it. How do we, how do we bridge the gap of coming up short? There's only one bridge that, that, that crosses that chasm, and that's Jesus Christ. He bridges the way for us. <clears throat> Grace means that salvation starts with God, not with man. God took the initiative. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, was slain before the foundation of the world. Before man ever sinned, God knew he would sin and God already knew what he was going to do. God had had that figured out and God, God initiates salvation. Hey, we love him because he first loved us. That's the only reason we love God. He initiated it. He come to seek and to save that which was lost. If he didn't make the first move, you and I would never make any move at all. Grace doesn't mean we do our part and God does His. Grace means we owe everything to God. If you leave the service today and you see a needy person on the side of the road and you stop and give them $5, that's unmerited favor. You gave him something he did not deserve. That he didn't work for. You gave him a gift. But if you leave the service today and you find somebody breaking into your car, stealing your radio, and you give him $5, that's grace. Because you've given him the exact opposite of what he really deserves. That's what God did for us through Jesus Christ. He gives us the exact opposite of what we really deserve. Because we really deserve to be punished for our sin against God in hell. That's what God does for us. Luke 18. You're in John 3 there. Just go to your left a little bit to Luke 18. This is an interesting parable Jesus gave to the Pharisees. To, to people who thought they were righteous and everybody else wasn't. Okay? Self-righteous. Jesus gave this example. Look at verse 9 of Luke 18. Are you alright? Okay. It, we'll, we'll get out a little bit later than normal because Xavier took so long in his testimony. All right? and, um, and I'm kidding. Alright, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a publican. Now that's publican, not republican, okay? But it's a, it's a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a real religious person. Very religious. Pharisees were very proud. Pharisees kept every law. In fact, they added laws in just to make sure that they would be better than anybody else. Pharisees often would, would uh, the leaders would carry a big key. Picture a big skeleton key. Big, bigger, big as my tie. Bigger, probably. And, and they would carry their own. You know what that is? That was the key to all knowledge. Just, just ask me. I hold the key to all knowledge. Okay? Nothing prideful there, is there? Uh -uh. You know, sometimes we'll joke and my wife will say something and she'll say, I didn't know what to do here. And I said, you should have uh, come to the source of all wisdom. And uh, now, of course, I'm, I'm teasing, okay? And... Uh, Sort of. No, but I'm, I'm kidding. And so, the Pharisees weren't. They were being honest. Okay? 
And they were being very prideful. So God says, okay, here's a Pharisee. Here's a publican. Publicans were known to steal and cheat and lie. Nobody liked the publican. Okay? And so here's a Pharisee and publican. Which one do you think is going to go to heaven? Well, the religious guy. I mean, notice what he says. The Pharisee stood and prayed with himself. God, I thank thee I'm not as other men are. Extortioners. Unjust adulterers, or even as this publican. Okay, so what do you do, Mr. Pharisee? I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Well, he's pretty good. He does, he's not an extortioner. He's not, he's not a, uh, uh, unjust. He's just in his dealings. He's not an adulterer. He's faithful in his marriage. He's, uh, he's not the publican. I fast twice a week. I give in that offering when it comes around. Now who do you think is going to heaven? Well, there's a pretty, pretty religious guy. If you're looking just outwardly, you'd say that guy's a pretty good guy. I mean, he's a pillar in the community. Then there's a publican. Notice what the publican does? Standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, as Jesus speaking, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know why it's difficult for man to say that it's all God and it's nothing of me? Because that's humbling. Why does man come up with, I've got to keep commandments, I have to get baptized, I have to go through confirmation? Because we want to say, I did something to go to heaven. It's humbling to say, I have to surrender and accept what Jesus has done for me. That without Him, I can't get there. I can't be saved. You just cry out to God, God, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Save my soul. God saves you. That's it. You say, man, is that fair? I don't know if it's fair or not, but it's gracious. It's grace. It's grace. Let me relay a story to you. A pastor gave this story, it perfectly illustrates God's amazing grace. He said this, I never dreamed that taking a child to Disney World would be so difficult, or that taking such a trip would teach me so much about God's amazing grace. He said our, our middle daughter had previously been adopted by another family. I'm sure this couple had the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. And after a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption and we ended up welcoming an eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them but left their adopted daughter with a family friend. And at least in the child's mind, that happened because she did something wrong that kept her from being present on the trip. So, he said, when we adopted our daughter, she had seen many pictures of Disney World. She heard about the rides and the characters and the parades. But when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she'd always been left on the outside. He said, when I found out about this history, I made plans to take her to Disney World the next time we would have a vacation. He said, I thought I had mastered the Disney World drill. I knew from previous experiences the prospect of seeing cast members in oversized mouse and duck costumes somehow turns children into squirming bundles of emotional instability. He said, what I didn't expect was that the prospect of visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in our newest daughter. In the month leading up to the Magic Kingdom vacation, she stole food, 
when a simple request would have gotten her a snack. She lied when it had been much easier to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister. And as days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, her behavior just got worse. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, I pulled our daughter into my lap to talk through her latest escapade. She said, I know what you're going to do. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but her downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She tried and failed that test several times before. She was living in a way that placed her as far away as possible from the most magical place on earth to her. He says... In retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment I was tempted to turn her fear to my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. But by God's grace, I didn't say that. Instead, I said, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded. Are you part of the family? She nodded again. And I said, you're going with us. Yes, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and what's wrong, but you're part of our family and we're not leaving you behind. I'd like to say her behavior grew better after that moment, but it didn't. Her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all the way to Lake Buena Vista. Still, we headed to Disney World on the day we had promised. It was a typical Disney day. Overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, lots of lines, mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going again someday. In our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, pensive, and a little weepy at times. But her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, held her, and asked, So how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled down into my lap. And after a few moments, she opened her eyes so slightly and she said, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. That's the message of saving grace. One day when the Lord calls us home, you're going to look Him, you're going to say, I'm here. But not because I'm good. Because I'm yours. I'm yours. That's the only way you get there. That's saving grace grace. But God doesn't just give us saving grace. I want you to look at 2 Thessalonians where God gives us securing grace. Securing grace. Not only saves us by grace, He secures us by grace. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 16, the Bible says this, Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse, chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God, we are saved by His grace and we are secure by His grace. Nobody, nobody is saved by grace and secure by works. I didn't do anything to get in. I can't do anything to get out. You know, it was a blessing, I'm sure, for Jack and Sherry to sit and listen to those two girls sing this one. There's no greater joy, you know, than to hear your children singing for the Lord, your children serving God. The 
truth is, those kids, he had three children, and of course his son's a missionary in Honduras. But those three children had a choice to make. They can grow up where dad and mom would be pleased to say, those are my children. Or they could grow up and live such a way where mom and dad might have to hang their head and say, those are my children. But you know what they can't change? They're his and her children. Once you're born, you can't get unborn. It's impossible. You can't get out. You can make them pleased with you. You can make them ashamed of you. But you're theirs because you were born to them. And When God saves you by His grace and puts you into His family by spiritual birth, by faith in Jesus Christ, you can make God pleased that you're His child. He can say, that's my son. That's my daughter. Or he can be ashamed to call you his son or daughter. But you know what you can never change? You're his son and daughter. That'll never change. We're kept by his grace. Two men were having an argument on the question of whether the believers were safe in Christ. And the one said to the other, I tell you, a child of God is safe only as long as he stays in the lifeboat. He may jump out, and if he jumps out, then he's lost. To the other replied, saying, You remind me of an incident in my own life. I took my little son out with me in a boat. I realized, as he did not, the danger of falling or even jumping into the water. So I sat with him all the time, and all the time I held him fast so he couldn't fall out or jump out of the boat. But, the first speaker said, he could have wiggled out of his coat and got away in spite of you. Oh, the other man said, you misunderstood me if you supposed I was holding his coat. I was holding him. God's not holding on to your coat. God's holding on to you. In fact, he says we're in his hand. We're in the hand of Jesus. And then Jesus said his hand is in the hand of the Father. And nobody can pluck you out of his hand. Uh, and, hey, do I deserve that? No. That's His grace. I'm secure by His grace. You're the recipient. If you're here today and you know Christ as your Savior, you're the recipient of amazing grace. Amazing grace. The third thing I want you to see this morning is in Titus chapter 2. And that is sanctifying grace. The book of Titus chapter 2. Notice with me verse number 14. Well, let's back up to verse number 11. Because it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, wait a minute, what's teaching us? The grace of God that appearing salvation appearing to all men. So the grace of God is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly when? In this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Grace. How how can I live soberly? Soberly doesn't mean not drunk. It simply means serious. Live seriously for God. So I'm going to live serious about this Christian life. How can I live seriously, righteously, and godly in this world? Only by God's grace. If I don't have the grace of God to help me, if I don't have the grace of God to live that way, I can't do it. I'll flop and fail every time. So will you. We have to have His grace. And so it's the grace that teaches us. Someone says, well, you believe if it's all grace, then people just get saved and live any way they want. Oh no, you don't understand grace. The Bible says in Romans 6 and verse 1, what shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Say, no, 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 no. You understand, God gives us the, the ability now and the desire to live right. I tell those guys in prison, 
You have to understand something. God changes your desires. I, I want to announce to you today, church, since last Sunday, uh, January the 6th till this Sunday, January 13th, I want you to know I drank a beer every time I wanted one last week. Now, I'd also like to tell you I never drank one. You know why? I had no desire to have one. You understand? I don't want those things anymore. I don't want things that, that, that would hurt God. I, don't want, I, I didn't take any drugs. I didn't uh, watch any pornography. I, don't, I didn't cuss anybody out this week. You know why? God doesn't want those things. And I don't either. See? God has given out by His grace. By His grace. He gives you His, His undeserved blessing and goodness to me creates in me a desire to live right and to please Him. It's, Philippians tells me it's God working in me to will and to do of His good pleasure. The fact that you wanted to get up and come to church today, you can't take credit for that. That was God. God gave you that desire to want to get up and come to church. Not everybody out there is in church today. You understand? Okay? That's God. You say, well, I've, I've been reading my Bible every day. Well, praise God. It's God that gives you that desire to want to do that. You understand? It's all His grace. It's Him working in me both to will, that's to want to, and the ability to do His good pleasure. I think it's Harry Ironside told the story. He said, uh, some years ago I had a little school for young Indian men and women who came to my home in Oakland, California from the various tribes in northern Arizona. One of these was a Navajo young man of usually keen intelligence. One Sunday evening, he went with me to, meet, to our young people's meeting. They were talking about Galatians. And the special subject was law and grace. They were not very clear about it. And finally, one turned to the Indian and said, I rather wonder, wonder, wonder our Indian friend has anything to say about this. He rose to his feet and said, Well, my friends, I've been listening very carefully because I'm here to learn all I can in order to take it back to my people. I do not understand all that you're talking about, and I do not think you do yourselves. But concerning this law and grace business, let me see if I can make it clear. I think it's like this. When Mr. Ironside brought me from my home, we took the longest railroad journey I've ever taken. We got out at Barstow, California, and there I saw a, the most beautiful railroad station and hotel I've ever seen. I walked all around and saw at one end a sign that said, Do not spit here. I looked at that sign and then looked down at the ground and saw many had spitted there. And before I could think what I'm doing, I have spitted there myself. Isn't it strange when the sign says, do not spit here? But he says, I came to Oakland to go to the home of the lady who invited me to dinner today, and I'm in the nicest home I have ever been in. Such beautiful furniture and carpeting. I even hated to step on them. I sank into a comfortable chair, and the lady said, Now, John, you sit there while I go out and see whether dinner is, is, is ready. I looked around at the beautiful pictures and the grand piano. I walk around all those rooms, and I'm looking for a sign. And the sign I'm looking for is, Do not spit here. But I look around at those beautiful drawing rooms, and I cannot find a sign like this. I think what a pity when there is such a beautiful home and to have people spitting all over it. Too bad they don't put up a sign. So I look over the carpet but cannot find anybody spitted there. What a queer thing. Where the sign says do not spit, a lot of people spitted. Where there was no sign at all in that beautiful home, nobody spitted. Now I understand. The sign is law. But inside the home, it is grace. They love their beautiful home. And they want to keep it clean. They do not need a sign to tell them so. I think that explains this law and grace business. 
As he sat down, there was a murmur of approval that went around the room. And Harry Ironside said, I think that may be the best illustration of law and grace that I have ever heard. Do you understand? When you're saved by grace, and God continues to work in your life by grace to keep you and to equip you to serve Him and to enable you to please Him, to enable you to serve Him. You know what? I don't want to spit anywhere on His grace. I want, to, I want to keep it as beautiful and as nice and as clean as I possibly can. God's grace is amazing. Amazing grace. That's why Paul said in the text we read today, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I hope you can say that today. By the grace of God, I am what I am. God's grace is amazing. God's grace is admonishing. But the good news is God's grace is available. If you've never been the recipient of God's grace, you maybe made your way in here and it's not normally where you might go to church or uh, you just had a prompting this morning to get up and come to church and this is where you came, but it might have been exactly what God wanted you to hear. Because God wanted you to receive His grace this morning and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and receive His gift of eternal life and to settle this matter of where you'll spend eternity. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, receive Him today. Accept His gift of eternal life. Say, oh, I don't deserve it. Hey, i got good news for you. None of us do. None of us do. We're all undeserving, but thank God... He offers it to everyone. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're one of the whosoevers. Thank God I was too. Amazing, amazing, amazing grace. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you for your amazing grace that saves us, your amazing grace that secures us, and your amazing grace that sanctifies us, it sets us apart, enables us to live a life that pleases you. It's all because of God's grace. I understand more and more as we, as I study this wonderful, wonderful aspect of grace, this attribute that you have. It's just amazing. Thank you for being so gracious to us. Minister and speak to people's hearts this morning, Lord. And I trust your will to be done in each and every life.